and welcome to Science on Trial and Error. Before we start with this week's interview, let me just say how grateful I am to all of you for tuning in to the last episode and for being here this time too. A huge thank you for all your messages and kind words of support. This podcast has been a dream of mine for quite some time and it makes me so happy to hear that it resonates with you. Please stay in touch and let me know what you think. I am so looking forward to hearing from you. Oh, and if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share it with your science friends or Twitter followers. Thanks a lot. Okay, so my guest today is a dear friend of mine, Yosman Babaddar. She comes from India. She's a neuroscientist and a PhD student in the group of Josef Cicivari at IST Austria, where she's investigating the memory formation in the context of spatial navigation. Yosman got her dual bachelor's and master's degrees from Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, ISER. When she's not experimenting in the lab, she's experimenting in her kitchen and her food-centered parties are legendary. Yosman is also a keen traveler with several impressive hikes already ticked off her bucket list and many more waiting in store. Books have a special place in her heart and she's the only person I know who can quote Friends episodes line by line. I really wanted to include this conversation as one of the first episodes. Yosman is a truly inspiring person and has a contagious passion for science. Please welcome Yosman Bapaddar. Hi Yosman, well, welcome and thank you for accepting the invitation to Hi, be Kasia. a guest. Thanks a lot. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Everything is okay. I'm very excited. Thank you. And I can't wait to to dig deep and find out more about you. Sounds scary. <laughs> so should we start with the familiar? Should we talk about your work a bit? Sure. Uh, so you're a PhD student in the group of Josef Cicivari uh, who works on spatial memory? That's correct. So it's basically a group that um, study systems neuroscience and we the group as a whole is trying to understand how memories are formed, how neural circuits can actually encode complex information and the model the model circuit that we use is the other circuits in the brain that are involved in memory formation of the of spatial navigation and space around you. So essentially what we do is we use the fact that these circuits encode space in order to construct certain um, mazes and behavioral paradigms that we can get animals or rodents in this case, rats and mice to run around and perform certain tasks and then try and understand how memories are formed, how they are encoded in the brain, how they are stored in the brain and how later on they can be subsequently recalled. Okay, so uh, these are just this grid cells, right? One of the cells that are involved in this? One of the cells, yes. Um, grid cells and place cells, I think, just historically are the most famous because um, they were awarded the, the Nobel Prize. Uh, the Mosers and John O'Keefe, they jointly got the Nobel Prize for the, their work in grid cells and uh, place cells. But there are a lot more cells that are involved in this. Um, yes, and the circuits are very complex and there's a lot of interaction between slightly different brain regions. And it's, it's very interesting to, to understand how, how memories can be encoded using the system. Your focus is on a specific brain region? My particular focus actually is the interaction between two different brain regions and the idea is to try and understand how information kind of flows or is shared between these specific regions of the brain. So when I do my experiments, I try and collect data from both these regions so that I can understand as an animal is performing a task or as a memory is being created or as a memory is being recalled, what is going on in these two brain regions and whether they are talking to each other or not or what, what is going on, yeah. So is this um, memory that functions in the spatial navigation actually a short-term or long-term memory? Can you track both of them? De definitely. Um, so... Yeah, you can of course track both of them. So you can do experiments where you test memory over shorter time durations, let's say a couple of hours to maybe a day or so, and over longer time durations where you teach the animal a cert certain task and then see what happens to this memory a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, or a couple of months later. 
Uh, yeah, definitely. You can use the system to probe both short-term and long-term memories. So your experimental setup involves a rodent that learns a certain um, environment. That's correct. And then they have to perform a task repetitively over That's time. Correct. And then you check. Do you check also how fast they react? And is there a way that you can assess that the memory has has formed already? How how can you say? So, so the way we get these animals actually to do the task is to, to motivate them. And the way you motivate animals is to control the amount of food you give them so that they're a little bit hungry mm -hmm. and you hide rewards uh, on the arena or the maze that you have designed for them so that they have some reason to do the task and not because you just sat and asked them and begged them, told them you needed a PhD degree. <laughs> but yes, so you can motivate the animals to do these tasks and it's... Often it's, it's, it's clear if an animal has learned or not because if an animal has learned then they will do exactly what is needed very rep repeatably and very robustly in order to get the reward. If the animal is not sure about what needs to be done or has forgotten you can often quite easily see it because he will end up you know kind of wandering around the maze or not going straight to the reward immediately. So yes, so you can measure uh, you can obviously depending on the type of maze you can come up with different measures as to see whether the animal has actually learnt mm -hmm. this particular um, how to solve this particular problem or not. I see. This may be a naive question mm -hmm. but how comparable do you think or do you know is is actually the memory formation between the rodents and the higher primates or humans? So the regions of the, the brain that we study which is basically yeah uh, the temporal lobe and you know hippocampus and media entorhinal cortex are actually very very conserved across species and it is true that the rodent brain looks slightly different from from the that, that of higher primates but there is a lot of information that we learn from these brains that in some places either directly you can see in other higher primates or you will find sort of analogous brain regions doing analogous things. So yes, um, because they're easy to work with and they are relatively smart, you can actually do interesting experiments with them and the information that you get is not necessarily just uh, applied to just them. Why did you actually want to look into spatial um, memory? Was there any specific reason for this? Mm, I think I find spatial navigation to be very interesting because it's a very nice model system in some sense to use in order to to um, study, you know, how circuits encode information. And I must say, partly, I was also a little bit swayed by the whole fervor that was created with the Nobel Prize. And mm -hmm. it was very interesting to see that such interesting cells exist in the brain, like, you know, place cells, grid cells. And now, of course, I know that there's a whole lot more and a whole lot more that's just not understood. So, yeah, it's, it's quite cool to see that it's you can... It's super fascinating. Yeah. But, yeah, essentially, there's... I don't want to oversimplify, but you know, that there's a particular neuron in the brain that could respond to just a particular position in space. That's, that's kind of cool. That's a bit mind-blowing, I would <laughs> say, even, yeah. Um, let's start then with, with your childhood or when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. Were you one of these kids that are like super fixed on on school or like on on science in general was it something that in your house was very i think very alive i think given that both my parents are in academia it is kind of hard not to have science at home in general you know with mom and dad talking about certain things and also given the fact that i lived in a housing colony that was part of an institute um, I got access to a lot of things like science days and open days at the institute and my friends parents were scientists so you could go and visit their uh, experimental labs if, if you wanted to and things like that so science was something that I think was just part of my childhood growing up that was inescapable. So your dad was a professor of physics yes. and your mom was in math? My mom taught math, yeah, at the university level. So were you mostly leaning towards um, math, math, science? Math. In fact, I hated physics. <laughs> it wasn't my favorite. But no, I really, really loved math through most of school. In fact, I hated biology. 
I, I really hated biology. It was just a bunch of facts that you had to memorize and then reproduce in the exam. That, that was it. That was nothing. So the thing that drawn you to math was the problem that you had to solve. Yes, solving problems and that, that just required using logic, not a bunch of things that you had to memorize and if you don't remember then, you know. So you didn't see yeah. biology as a problem kind of no. science? No, okay. because it was like, if I'm right, like what Rutherford said, it's just stamp collecting. <laughs> that's what it was. So that's why I kind of hated it. But I think in the ninth grade, that's when we were first introduced to genetics. Okay. And like, we studied these um, Mendel's monohybrid and dihybrid crosses and things like that when suddenly it seemed like there was some logic in some sense uh, to biology and there was something interesting about it and that's when I was willing to give it a chance. So was it also uh, a matter of the teachers? Of course, yes. Did I you have a very I influential had, teachers of science? or? I think in general I had really good science teachers so at least if I remember right, like 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th grades, I had really good science teachers and it was just, I didn't like biology. But I really liked, liked just genetics and I was willing to overlook the rest of the flaws of biology, if I you see. will. I see, I see. So then you say genetics was the thing that, that started the yes. interest in biology yes. and now you're working on neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when this actually Yeah, so it was, it was around the same time because I suddenly realized there was something that biology had to offer. So I think I started like reading popular science books and one of the ones that I, I don't know how I ended up reading that, who recommended it to me was B.S. Ramachandran's books ah, on neuroscience. Yes. And I really liked them and, and yeah, I think that's where I started thinking about the brain as something that's really, really cool. And yeah. So when you were deciding for your for your studies after your mm -hmm. high school or high school, secondary school and yeah. that, um, were you looking for a program that would be really strong in neuroscience or were you just looking for something that will give you a chance to to yeah. learn more about biology? I was, I was basically, I, I knew I wanted to do science, so I knew I wanted to do a bachelor's and master's in science, and I was looking for, for a good university that would give me good education, with good, good biology, not so much neuroscience, I didn't, yeah. Um, and, and I was hoping that I would get to go to a university that also allowed me to do some math, because <laughs> that love for math had, had still not gone away, so hoping to have a bit of a bit more of an interdisciplinary undergraduate research and and did you find it in your study yes yes so i was lucky enough to do that because these ICERs or the indian institutes of science education and research they offer five year degrees that give you a dual bachelor's masters degree and the first two years irrespective of what you want to major in you do all subjects maths physics chemistry and biology that's great so for f the first two years, that is four semesters, I could do everything and then decide that I wanted to major in biology. So the environment you were in was actually very interdisciplinary? Very, very much so. They strongly and encouraged did you it. feel pulled at any point to, to steer away from biology or yes. was it... Yes. Oh, yeah. Even at the end of the second year, I wasn't... I was not sure I, I wanted to do a biology major and I was very close to picking mathematics. I think the only thing that tipped tipped the scales in favor of biology is that I really, really love working in the lab, getting my hands dirty. And if I had taken a math major, I would not have been able to do any lab work whatsoever. That's the only reason I ended up picking biology at that <laughs> point. So how much did your parents influence your decision? Were they really uh, involved? Were they giving you any kind of advice about especially your mom, since seeing as she was in maths, was she actually saying like, yeah, yeah, this is great or like try to look somewhere else. No, no, I think throughout my parents have told both me and my brother that they don't care what either of us does as long as what we do is something that we love to do. So obviously given that they are both in academia, there was more of a, I mean, our growing up, we were biased more towards science as opposed to other fields, but we were always encouraged to do what we wanted and yeah, my mom was always willing to, to sit and listen to me struggle as I decided. <laughs> and I don't think she either pushed me or pulled me towards math or my dad towards physics or any such thing. So, yeah. 
but they were they were very supportive and this yeah, was definitely always, important. Yeah, they've always been. Yeah, that's great. So you had to move out of your family house to to go for your studies. Yes. And uh, you were living in a student in, accommodation, yes, right? Yes. So did you did you find it hard, or was it actually kind of it fun was to be perfectly fine? Away? I was so excited to go. Um, I was really happy that first night in the hostel room. It, it felt strange because you're not at home in your bed, but I was excited, and apparently my mom and dad were miserable. But it was <laughs> fine, and and I remember a friend of mine. She was telling me when we were in the fourth year. Uh, one of the faculty's professors, he he had asked her, you know, how did you feel in your first year? Because we're trying to to rethink how to offer some counseling and support to first year students because they leave their home. And she was like, I was completely fine. And then she was asking me and I said, even I was fine. And then apparently the professor said about a lot of students are not fine. And so we both were wondering, you know, whether there's something wrong with us because we were so happy to leave home. So you made good friends where they also going into biology direction or were you a mixture of, of different disciplines? In a mixture. I mean, some of my, actually out of the, the really good friends that I have, I think only two went into biology. The others are in physics, chemistry, so. And did you have a chance to work in different labs in this time? Yes, so usually every summer you are encouraged to do a project. Um, and I did five different projects, mm -hmm. five different summers in different places. and. I use that, I think you could approach summer projects with two different mindsets. One is you know exactly what you want after your master's, so you work towards that goal, you know, working in the same lab or similar labs to get papers. Or if you're a little bit unsure like I was, use it as an opportunity to explore um, certain avenues and then decide whether that's really what you want to do or not. And that's what I did. So, so what did you try? So, for example, um, the first first summer, actually it's funny, <laughs> now that I said I didn't quite like physics, my first summer was spent doing a project in quantum physics. <laughs> because, because we were introduced to that in the first year and it was something that I found really fascinating. Then I thought, okay, it's just the first summer, let me use this to experiment and see what it would be like. So, to do so was it theory or did you actually do any, like... It was theoretical. Experimental work. It was experimental in the sense they were computer simulations that I okay. wrote programs for, but no wet lab work. And it was a lot of fun, and I did some interesting stuff, which I cannot fully remember right now. <laughs> but uh, I, my, at the end, I walked away saying, okay, it was great, but no, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And the second summer, I said, okay, I'm always confused about math and biology. Why not do a project that is, you know, some kind of mathematical computational biology? That was also theoretical. Um, and it was really great. The boss I work with, uh, he's he's really good in his field, and it was it was a lot of fun. But I walked away thinking, I really really like this, but I cannot not do experimental work. I I definitely want the wet lab work. And so then the third summer I spent doing in an experimental neuroscience group where I got okay. to work with the brain, I got to do experiments, and I really enjoyed that. And I think. That has basically um, informed my PhD decision. The fourth summer I did, uh, it, was, it was theoretical neuroscience again, modeling stuff. But the reason I did that is because my fifth year project, um, you had to choose your master's thesis advisor from within the university. You couldn't That's choose it. someone from outside. And the choice that I had for neuroscience was either do experimental neuroscience that is, that's at the molecular cellular level, or do a theoretical neuroscience project that's more systems level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And since I'm more interested at, a, at looking at the brain at a systems level, I figured if I did a computational theoretical master's thesis, even though it's not what I want to do, it would help me in my PhD and, and further. And so that's why I did that for... So it seems like the pro actually this program gave you a lot of chances to try different things. So how did you discover systems neuroscience? Was it a conference or it was just uh, work in the lab that... Um, no, I think it was just, just in general reading mm -hmm. um, popular science books and then listening to talks online and looking at, us, at stuff up online and figuring out that... So the brain can be studied at multiple levels and they are all very valid levels to ask questions at, but I really... I somehow found myself getting attracted more towards a system level um, approach of studying the brain. So where you look at networks and ask 
more higher level mm-hmm. questions. Yeah. I think I think what fascinated me always was how the how the brain makes decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So So was it an easy decision to to decide to to go for a PhD? Was it something that you really was Pretty much. Like, I think through my five years at ICER it just I was more and more sure that PhD is what I want to do because in general I love solving problems. It's just a lot of fun. And so PhD is one gigantic problem. <laughs> So then PhD application started. What did you have in mind at the beginning? Did you have a specific program that you were aiming for? Or was it more about the the group leaders that you were looking into? Or did you look actually for the programs where you can still try out things, like do the rotation system? And So there were three, I think, three main things in my head when I applied. One is that I definitely wanted the rotation system and coursework like the American graduate system, Mm -hmm. because even if you end up in a group that does the kind of research you really like and the the PI has the right name and position, if you can't work well in terms of personality and, and you just can't work well with your PI, it can be hell and I was not willing to do that. That's why the rotations were very important for me. Um, secondly, like I said, I wanted the coursework. I I just didn't feel like at the end of the master's, you know, that's enough. It gives you a chance to learn more. And, and, and usually when you have coursework, then you, you can also pick some things that are not strictly related to your field. So a little bit of interdisciplinarity, I wanted to keep this Mm -hmm. alive. And thirdly, I kind of knew what kind of research I wanted. So I knew which PIs I would like to work with, the ones that are in the field of spatial navigation, uh, systems neuroscience studying spatial navigation. So therefore, I would usually look for the PI, see which university they are in, and then see what uh, neuroscience grad programs those universities offer and see what the course structure looks like, how much they encourage or will help you with uh, taking courses outside of the neuroscience program. And, and then decide. Yeah. So you had quite specific criteria that that limit your options a lot, or were there still actually quite a few places? There were still quite a few places. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't feel limited. In fact, I it felt crazy initially. How do you narrow it down and apply just <laughs> to a handful of places? Were you considering that you might change your mind after rotations, or the topic was very set for you, like set in stone? No, I, I, I did, I did, um, I did, I was willing to give, give myself the chance to change my mind. Mm -hmm. I I don't think I would have shifted radically from, let's say, systems neuroscience to, to plant plant biology. (laughs) I I don't think so. I think what could have influenced me after rotations would be, let's say, not studying spatial navigation, but studying decision making in, in rats or something like this. But I don't think I would have shifted really far away from systems neuroscience. So you were applying for the programs and sending your applications. Did you have help from your university or was it more like your friends and family were kind of helping you out with this? Because of course it's a gigantic Sure. I think, I think It was university in the sense I would ask some of my professors to read my statement of purpose and various motivation letters so that I could get some feedback from them. But otherwise, it was mostly friends and especially people that had gone through the process one or two years before. So, you know, alumni of the university that I knew and I would contact and I sat and chatted with them or some other friends outside the university that I knew had applied for PhD and gone through, gotten through certain programs. So I I would ask them, you know, for their tips and tricks. So what was the, the hardest for you actually in this process? Mm, I think the hardest was when the rejection started coming in. <laughs> the rest of it was just long and painful, but it was not hard. So did you know, because I think this is a common problem when we are kind of going through the process of being in your studies and even if you feel like you are doing well, I think we still have a tendency, a lot of us, to to not sell ourselves enough. Mm-hmm. Did you also have this issue? Did you have to get feedback from other people to actually I, I think this present yourself in a way that was maybe not... Yeah, it was a bit maybe bold. Yeah, or... I think definitely I did get this feedback and I had to change like a couple of motivation letters and statements of purposes that I'd written, especially when I wanted to apply 
to the US mm -hmm. because I think they are a little bit more, um, as you said, bold. <laughs> People tend to tend to market themselves very well, and I, uh, yeah, I, I'm not like that really. So I did, yeah, I did take, uh, I hope I did at least take on board the suggestions that uh, two of my professors gave me. Um, yeah, you just, it's, it's. I think this is just a. A difference in in cultures yes yeah. I, I agree so then the interviews began mm -hmm. and you had your interviews at the Institute that you are at now so at IST mm -hmm. Austria and how did you find this process um, I thought it would be nerve-wracking but it was actually quite fine um, uh, all three of the people that I had requested I would like to be interviewed by actually IST was able to honor that um, they were all very widely different interviews and I think I walked out of all three of them not fully sure <laughs> how I did but I, I, I mean I know that there's a certain amount of knowledge that I had and so that I was confident in and whenever I didn't know anything I'm, I'm, I'm also okay saying I'm sorry I don't know this and usually I, I, through the interviews I, I would always think out loud yeah. And so that that was okay. Yeah, it was okay. It was it was really nice to actually come and see the institute. I think that helped a yeah. lot in, in informing my decision to accept the offer. So you started a couple of years ago mm -hmm. as a PhD student, and ISD has a rotation system. Mm -hmm. And um, well, currently you're in group of Joseph Chichivari. And you did rotate with him, but you did also some rotations that were out of your discipline, right? Right, right. So I did my first rotation with Josef Chichvari and I basically applied to ISC because of him and his group. And so after the first rotation, I, I really liked it. I really liked the group as well. And I think we had a discussion, Josef and I, and he he basically indicated that he would be happy to take me in his group but told me to do the other rotations and to see how I feel because you know he didn't want to start limiting me which was I thought nice and so yeah so therefore I decided that one of the rotations I would I would do something slightly different because I kind of know what group I'm going to be in and for the next four years I'm going to end up doing this kind of science so maybe I can use it to to explore a bit and and therefore I did one of my rotations with Christoph Lampert and I thought, you know, I want to spend the next four years studying real brain networks. Maybe I can try seeing what the hell artificial neural networks are about and do some machine learning and play around with that. And it was it was kind of fun because um, Joseph, a postdoc in Joseph's group, he actually gave me some real data to work with and we, we built a, a neural network an artificial neural network that would, I know, do some machine learning and play around with that data. And that was, that was a lot of fun. So I don't know if I will, I'm not using any of the techniques I learned in that rotation for my PhD, but I don't think it hurts to just learn stuff. It was difficult for you to, to go to such a group, seeing that your background was not strictly, let's say, computer science or data science. And to, to join for a project, did you receive a lot of help from the group and enough support for someone that is from a different discipline so that this worked well for you to to not only just scratch the surface but actually learn something so um so well definitely the rotation with Christoph Lampert was really really nice because I remember in the in the one of the first few meetings I had with him I told him that I'm going to be able to contribute nothing towards his group or towards his <laughs> research and he was quite happy with having me on as as um, a rotation student that basically goes through a teaching rotation mm -hmm. and that I thought was really nice of him. Yeah. So you gained a lot of perspective outside mm -hmm. of your of your field and do you think this this actually helped you with your project or even with the way you view science? Well I'm, so with my project sort of yes because uh, the project I do involves a lot of analysis of, of a lot of data, so yes. But also in general, just for me, um, I always feel like it's great to really know about your research and go really into your field and question, but it's also nice to have a bit of an overview of what other people are doing and other kinds of cool things because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. And 
So your PhD started after your rotations and you had to prepare your project by yourself, right? Very much. So um, how did it work? Because a lot of students going into PhD, they are very worried about that. Mm -hmm. They are worried how difficult will it be to find a question or how much support will you get from your PI. And I think knowing how how the master theses uh, work or there are even some PhD projects that are really already specified when you apply for them. Was this something that was that was stressful for you or did you find it exciting to, to try to find your own it was thing? Not, it was not stressful for me. Um, partly because through the rotation it, it was obvious to me that at least the Chichwari group is really nice and very easy to talk to and discuss with. So I was sure that I'd have people to discuss with and bounce ideas off of. And also because, uh, I don't want to sound rude, but I, I feel like, you know, the PhD is a project that you are doing. Shouldn't you come up with your question and have ownership and feel proud of, of, of the science you're doing? But I don't want to say this because people that are given projects can also be very proud of the project that they have. So, I mean, I, I don't want to sound like condescending. <laughs> I think some degree of independence is just absolutely necessary if you sure. want to get the PhD. I think anyway, if you even if you're given a project, you can still find your own way within it. Sure. It's just for some people, you know, especially switching maybe, switching fields, mm -hmm. it can be hard to sure. to find the, the question that is a niche or, you know, you don't have that much knowledge and suddenly you are like in the deep waters and you have to find it. So then... I think having a question at least brought up to you by your, Fair your PI can, can help Fair to enough. steer you in a good direction. I mean, for me at least, you know, I, I, I don't exactly remember the timeline, but I remember talking to, to Josef and he, he, was, he was telling me that hmm, it would be nice if you can think of something to do with the entorhinal cortex because one of our postdocs is going to leave and then there's going to be no one in the lab that's working in this region of the brain so think about it and so i was thinking about it and coming up with questions and i discussed it with people in the group and then also with joseph and then we finally i think together whittled it down to a question that's both interesting exciting yet reasonably achievable i mean you don't <laughs> want it to have like a zero percent chance of success because that's demoralizing of course yeah so your project has started and well at the beginning, we are all very, very motivated and very excited. There is a pressure that starts to build up mm -hmm. and a lot of people start to remind you that this is a marathon, not a sprint, and you are very optimistic, but then you start seeing this, this bumps on the road. Was it, was it very surprising when the first bump happened or were you expecting it? And... Um, um, hmm. no, it was not surprising. I yeah. expected to fail, that's <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I definitely went through ups and downs. Um, some really, really down downs where I, where I called home crying and I, because my dad is a physicist, a professor, he's done a PhD and I, and I told him the job of parents is to protect their kids, so why would you knowingly <laughs> encourage me to do a PhD? That's quite harsh. <laughs> but, but yeah, they pass. I mean, things get better. What, what did you find was the best way to, to deal with these bumps? Because I think a lot of people start their work and they are very work-focused, and at some point the work becomes very like a major part of their day and their lives and they are just the feeling that comes with every failure is very overpowering because they don't have a proper life balance and I think this is something that that still is a big issue for PhD students around right. so um, what is the this thing that keeps you from feeling very down about your work outside of work that keeps you kind of going I, I mean, there are, there are a lot of things that I do outside of work, but I don't think any of those actually helps me deal with the failures during, during work. What actually helps me deal with that is just the fact that you, when you chat with people in your group specifically, and I'm not talking about just general PhD students, but people that have actually done the exact kind of experiments that you have done, 
and they they tell you that you know we also went through things like this and that is fine and that especially in my case when my boss he himself i remember once being really miserable about something not having worked out and he came up to me and he was like you know so and so in the in our group and how his work is going so well now but do you you ask him which which of his experiments actually started working and it was not the first or the second or even the tenth and so he was like don't worry these things take time and they will they will eventually work and then 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 it, then it feels okay that you know this is how it happens people have gone through it and your boss is also aware that you know you're not an idiot or a moron and that it's just just part of learning the learning curve and it takes time and and, and well experiments are messy of course so, they are messy so yeah i think this is what what makes me sure that the kind of work i'm doing that that i'm not useless and that the phd's <laughs> are just that's just how they go the other things outside of work just um yeah just yeah they're just a good distraction they're and there're other things that you know i enjoy in life so you're yeah. in your free time what is it that keeps you <laughs> i think the the from going insane three things that i that i absolutely love to do the most one is to read uh, all the way from popular science to ridiculous fantasy fiction that takes <laughs> me into a different dimension into a different planet with different species um the second is to cook I I just love cooking it's it's even just sitting and chopping things and getting things all chopped and ready for for a cook on one day is just so soothing and just so much fun for me and finally it's hiking and you know being in Austria that's that's really great because it's a hiker's paradise So it is very helpful when you have these different bumps on the road um to talk to to your friends in the lab and and get some sort of um yeah comfort in in realization that they also went through this um but this can of course make you um a bit well a bit sad or even a bit um disencouraged or demotivated about science and uh, i think it's important if you really want to stay in science to keep the love for science alive to keep the I fire agree. burning i agree so i was wondering whether there's something that that keeps this passion um alive in you whether there's something outside of your research or something that you are um particularly passionate about that the this the errors and the failures in your phd or the missteps they are not able to to really kill it yeah yeah um for sure i think there are two things one is i i like to just read popular science articles about stuff that is not at all related to biology or neuroscience and usually for me that's astronomy and astrophysics and i really love re- reading about the the latest discoveries or the research going on in that field. so were you following the mars landing definitely definitely <laughs> i follow that and and you know all the various um rovers or flights or missions that are sent into space all the way from NASA to SpaceX to Israel China's uh, <laughs> launches plus you know it's just interesting research about what they found about this latest discovery about some planet doing something or the the question mark that people have about beetle juice and how its light is constantly dimming and not and there's confusion about what's going on there so that somehow always then gets me back excited about about science and research and the other thing that i think never ever fails to to motivate me is to see people's reactions when i talk to them about the kind of research i do because they think it's so cool and so interesting <laughs> and their enthusiasm and is infectious so yeah so i i love doing that and i think one way of doing that is is through science outreach activities which i try and take part in as much as i can mm. Were you were you always doing it? Was it, is it something that you started doing here, or were you doing it also in your studies? I, I did. I did it through throughout university. My university, I really enjoyed it. Like our university, every year once a day, we had a day in which um, they would invite students from all from all the nearby schools uh, to come and visit the labs and see what's going on. And and people would put up demonstrations of you know interesting things in science, in physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, and and every year i would do put up a demonstration once i did in mathematics once in biology once i helped design the entire biology the 
demonstrations. I was part of the team that kind of designed the entire floor. So you walk through yeah. the biology lab, see different things. And I, and I really love doing that. And at IST also, I have done it. And uh, me and another friend of mine from the lab, we, we talk to people on one of the European researchers nights. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Yeah, we were telling them about our research and we had a little game for them and we were showing them, you know, what we do and how we do it. And talking to kids about this, I think is the most fun because sometimes they have the most interesting questions and it's just it's just awesome to talk to them about such stuff so you say it's infectious to see their joy but it's probably also your love of science that then comes out in as clear as purest form you know you kind of forget about all the bad stuff and it's just your initial love that starts to to come out i sincerely hope that i am (laughs) i am portraying a, a scientist in love with science and not a cynical phd student yeah And um, yeah, do you think you will want to still continue to do this after you are done with your PhD? Will you try? Absolutely. I, and I, I would most likely do a postdoc of my, after my PhD. And for sure, I would want to, you know, take part in such activities throughout. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do after my postdoc, but I hope at least I can still be involved in some amount of science outreach at some small level because I enjoy it and I I also think it's important for the scientific community as a whole to do a better job of conveying our the 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 way science functions and and the results that we come up with of doing a better job of conveying that to to the general public because I don't think the media does a very good job of that. I mean the misinformation is definitely a also, huge problem. Not just misinformation but also I think sens- sensationalization. Oh yeah, that, definitely. You know yes. that everything that we do we're always usually very guarded. We don't want to overclaim things and you know we're always like this result holds under these conditions and not yeah, eat chocolate every day it cures cancer. Kind of. Yes, I, I think, I mean, I think these events are really important and I think they have a very large impact. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes we don't even realize how big this impact is. So during these events, we, I mean, we tend to present science as this amazing thing that, that can really, well, drive you and it's so fascinating. Right. But do you think there is, there is still something in science, in academ- and academia, in the scientific community, that that leaves room for improvement, that that can still be, yeah, that can still be pushed to to be improved. Uh, absolutely, I'm I'm sure there are a lot of things, and uh, yeah, I I think one of the things that comes to mind for me, I I was aware of this, you know, during my university, but I I think during my PhD it's hit home a little harder. Is that Sometimes I think we can be, or at least I was, or a bit naive in in the way that I thought that academia was this really nice world where, you know, you do the hard work, you're interested, you're motivated, you do your hard work, you put in the time, and you will get all the results. You will get all the papers, you will get all the positions, you'll get all the grants, and you will get all the prizes, and great. I think it doesn't work this way because, unfortunately, there is competition even within academia. And it makes a big difference if you talk to the right people, you say the right things to the right people. Unfortunately, if you happen to be in one of the lesser well-known universities, not not so well-known universities, it's a bit of a handicap. You know, if you don't happen to have the right PI, you know, at the bottom, maybe a bit of a handicap. Obviously, none of these things is going to stop you from achieving. You know, you put in the hard work, and I'm sure you will get there somewhere. But I, but sometimes it just makes me a little sad that something that I thought, again, maybe naively, that you know, worked really well. You just do your part, and you will get the rewards. Doesn't often work that well. Sometimes there's a little bit of, dare I say it, politics that you have to play. Yeah, I mean. I think I was also very idealistic mm-hmm. coming into, like starting my PhD, uh, coming into to IST and like leaving my mm-hmm. country. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no direct translation between the amount of work you put and the success that you will get. Mm-hmm. And another thing is that I think what you call politics, this kind of networking that is I mean networking can be fun but I think what my what our studies made me realize is that also it's a necessity like 
it, you need to it definitely is a necessity have connections i mean it, networking is important because science is a collaborative effort as a whole and sure of course you need to network of course you need to collaborate talk to people come up with ideas together but i think it's what i what we are trying to say here i think is more like sometimes you need to know the right the people right, yes, to get exactly. the right, to get to wherever you want to get and yeah that's a, that's a bit icky i mean it's a bit demotivating at mm-hmm. times definitely yeah. because you feel like i can work really hard and I thought at the beginning that if I work really hard, it will just yeah directly translate into some level of, of you know, of success of the good paper and then the good offer. But sometimes it's it's kind of yeah it brings you down when you realize that perhaps if you had known this person, you actually could have ended up in the same place working a bit less or even ended up in a better place mm-hmm. with the same amount of effort. So, yeah, but how do you think we can improve this? It's a systemic thing, right? It's a bit of a bias that yeah. is encoded yeah. in the whole academia or even, you know, the publishing, all these yeah. communities. I'm, I'm afraid I don't have an answer. <laughs> I know this is this is not very cool to have a to complain and not have any solution to not offer up a solution. All that I can say is, yeah, hopefully. I I, I mean one thing that I do is I try, and and as you spend more time in your PhD, you get better at better at this. But like for example, when you read a paper. I think now you don't just just because the authors come from some top universities you don't just assume the paper is going to be very good. You know, you you try and decouple the the actual research content from the name, the name or the the university and or the journal or even the journal, yeah, exactly. exactly. So things like that or even when you are, you know, talking to people in a at a conference or potential candidates who want to join your group or something like this, try and be as objective about judging their 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 research qualities and abilities irrespective of the group that they came from or the university they did their undergrad in or the country that they've come from and try and not make these judgments but i mean yeah H- having said all of this i i don't i don't mean to imply that hard work is not going to get you something of course you work hard and at the end yes you will get some success it's just sometimes it just sucks that it's I mean yeah it's kind of like a bit of an illusion that that just falls a bit down yeah. but you you cannot really allow it to to make you bitter about yes. about your work you Or, just have to I mean it's a it's a tough realization but it doesn't mean that you cannot succeed it just means that it's not always going to be super fair yes and there is also you know there's a certain amount of luck that always. adds to it so this you cannot control so one thing that i really like when people ask is that what that's one thing yes if you had unlimited money what is the the question that you would like to to tackle or what is the the experiment that you would like to do i think people in our group like to joke that we would like to implant elephants <laughs> and sit atop them and record or introduce crocodiles to the IST pond and record from crocodiles. But so, but elephants, they have there's this joke about memory is it actually funded in any science or I have is no that idea. the reason for no, for no, no. to record them? Just or? just I think it's just cool to be able to sit on top of the elephant and I record. see. I, I see. see. I thought there is some sort of true scientific into this. rationale. No, no, no. 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 And if you didn't have to worry about money, yeah. but this would be probably brain related, right? It would definitely be brain related because I, I still find so. Are you sold forever? Fascinating. Yeah, it's it's an it's crazy. This organ is just so crazy. I mean, my brain right now is talking about my brain. <laughs> that is that always gets my head all messed up in a loop. And the brain is cool. So. Outside of your spatial mm-hmm. navigation or memory topic, mm-hmm. what is really cool for you? I think there are two 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 broad areas that I find really cool. One is decision making. How how is it that when you come to 
And I don't mean just a choice point, like a simple yes, no, but more complicated decisions that you have to make. How does the brain actually arrive at a conclusion? How do you weigh the pros and cons? How do you do <laughs> the probabilities, come up with them, and then sort of both either subconsciously or even consciously ca- arrive at a conclusion? So I find this very fascinating and very interesting to do. And I think the other thing that's really, really fascinating are the brain-machine interfaces. Where you can actually, yeah, of course, from the point of view of rehabilitation of of um, physically injured personnel and things like that, but also it's just, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting how you could you could replicate certain features of the brain using machines and and integrate it with your brain in order to to do interesting things. I right? yeah. It's, it's kind of great that even though we know so little about the brain, the little that we do know allows us to do such interesting things. So, yeah. Yeah. But another question that I like to ask people is like, if you could talk to someone, mm-hmm. dead or alive, mm-hmm. that is a scientist or maybe a person that really particularly inspires you, um, mm-hmm. who would that be? Who would you like to have tea with? and ask your burning questions or just to enjoy their company? I think, I, I must say I've not thought about this and maybe once I think about it, I would come up with a different answer. But right now, I, I think it would be Oliver Sacks. And it's just so sad that he passed away not, not too long ago, yeah. but he did such great, interesting research um, looking at patients with different kinds of, of syndromes and uh, coming up you know, understanding why the brain results in these very, very interesting and different um, phenotypes, let's put it that way. And I think his talks in general are really well done. And I figured he would be a fantastic person to just have a conversation with about the brain and what the brain does and how it achieves it. Yeah, I I think we're also the same, I think along the same lines, I would like to chat with V.S. Ramachandran. That's totally possible. (laughs) This this is alive. still yeah this is yeah. still doable so you should definitely it, does he actually because he writes the books right mm-hmm. and there's several of them that are really really great mm-hmm. and they are inspiring so many people around mm-hmm. the world but um, have you ever attended one of his talks or I've seen his talks online okay um, in fact when I was applying for PhD I just checked to see he's, <laughs> at least last time I checked he was uh, head of the neuroscience department at UCSD. But when I really looked at, at what his specific group does on a day-to-day basis, I, I realized that that's not what I really want to do. It's kind of interesting stuff. Is it too clinical stuff. or...? It's, it's very clinical. It, well, you, you end up working a lot with patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and often, I think it's in this kind of field, it's, it's useful to have an MD medical degree. It's too complicated. But just to be able to chat with him and ask yeah. him... Yeah, especially seeing as he really inspired your yeah, love yeah. for science, this would be a, yeah. a great meet. Yeah, I really wish that you have a chance. Thank you. Uh, in the future to talk to him. <laughs> Who knows where your path will lead you? Maybe. Who knows? Maybe he'll be a guest on your podcast, <laughs> and then I can. Yes. I can be a co-guest. Let's see. Let's see <laughs> on up episode one hundred fifty yes. or whatever <laughs> thousand. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I find this very entertaining, and I've learned a lot about you. And I think your love for science is very contagious. So I'm very happy that people will be able to Thank to you. I, I was, I must say, quite nervous in the beginning. But I think it, it's gone off pretty well. It's easy to talk to you. Thank you so much. <laughs>